Okay, we're live on YouTube and we will be starting. Oh, uh, um, my view of your screen is. Oh, there he goes. Oh, great. Is, is, your, is your view changing? No, I'm no, gonna... it's good. It's good. Okay. Go ahead and keep it um, keep it on because now the music is no longer there. Yeah, yeah. Um, just playing yeah. it back. Okay. Great. Well, let's get started. Nope. Going again. Well, anyways, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Nest. It's December 17, 2020, and we're streaming live with entrepreneurs and investors from around the world. I'm Jim Chu, and our goal here on the Nest is to connect entrepreneurs in frontier markets with angel investors worldwide. We stream live every Thursday, and all episodes are recorded and available on our website, findthenest.org. This week, we're hosting two exciting startups from Kenya, and we welcome three new investors to the program. Actually, two new investors and one returning investor. And uh, we'll hear about them in a second. But before that, let's hear a little bit more about our co-hosts, EAVCA and Victoria Ventures. Welcome to The Nest. Is there anybody here from EAVCA to um, tell us a little bit more about the organization? I guess not. How about Victoria Ventures? Hi, Jim. Right. Hi. Hi, everyone. This is Jason from Victoria. Yes, hi, Jason. Glad you could join Glad us. to be here. Glad to be here. Yes, in, in brief, Victoria is an early stage angel invest, investment network. So we explore opportunities across East Africa from an investment interest. And typically, we tend to be the first institutional investor that the companies have had. And on that basis, we expect to make either an investment or. I don't know if it's loud everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, let's make sure the music stays off. Okay, good. Yes. Go so ahead, we, please, Jason. Yes, yeah, so we are largely the early stage investors in the Eastern African region and sector agnostic. And at the moment, you have around six companies in our portfolio. Hopefully, we're going to get a bit, a bit more beginning early next year or probably later, 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 later this month. And I'm looking forward to hear what both Dovu and Fastaga have to present to the rest of the investors. Great. Well, welcome to the Nest and thanks for joining us. Thank All right, well, over to um, perhaps the next slide. Hi, Jim. Sorry, Esther here. Esther, how are you? Yes, from EAVA. Thank you for joining us. I'd love to hear a little bit about your organization. All right. Um, now, so I work for the East African Venture Capital Association. Um, and we're proud to be a part of this um, episode that's showcasing startups from East Africa. For those unfamiliar with um, the EVCA, we are the representative organization for venture capital and private equity in East Africa. Um, we, our mandate covers Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. And we have a network of over 100 private capital investors who are active in this market. And at the core of what we do is basically promote East Africa as a private capital destination while ensuring an, a favorable environment for investments to happen in this space. Um, you know, I have a lot to say about the organization, but really what I'm looking forward to is to hearing both Radhika and Mutembe pitch this uh, evening. So I will hand over the virtual microphone back to you. Great. Thanks, Esther. I appreciate you joining us and, uh, uh, and co-hosting this with us. All right, so going on to uh, announcements, uh, quick announcements about upcoming uh, sessions. So we have a holiday break for the next couple of weeks or next few weeks, actually. And then the next Nest will happen on January 14th. And then um, the Nest right after that, on the 21st, we will have a Francophone Nest with Hannah Subai as the host. And uh, a few technical tips as well. Uh, this is a interactive forum. This isn't a webinar. We really want everybody participating. So please, we'd love to hear your comments and questions. Introduce yourself in the chat box and uh, any comments and questions you have, please feel free to type them into the chat box. We'll do our best to make sure that uh, some of the, the most relevant ones come on to the show. Now over to the angels. We have three great angels here. We have a new angel, Kristen Wilson. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, I'm Kristen. I run a company called Spurt Solutions, which basically 
uh, provides a platform that connects MSMEs and startups to uh, professional services, typically management and consulting services, but also a range of professional services. And then the other thing I do in my spare time is investing in some of the incredible ventures that we come across and facilitating some of those um, investments within my network as well. And you're based in, in, and good luck in everyone. both California and uh, Nigeria. Did I understand that right? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So I'm typically shuttling between Lagos and Palo Alto, two quite interesting, but very, very different cities. Indeed, indeed. I'd love to hear more about that. Thanks for joining us. And Kurt, Kurt Davis. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Kurt. I uh, uh, have been on, listened on this uh, a few times this year and have connected with Jim uh, with his Haiti project. Um, we have a small nonprofit in Kakuma that's doing um, building out Wi-Fi networks at the moment. Uh, so, and we hope to extend that to other refugee camps after we build that out. Um, I traveled in Africa for about nine months in 2017 and just wrote a book about it. So you can see it here, uh, just published. Yeah. And uh, what's the name of the book, Kurt? It's called it's called Finding Soul from Silicon Valley to Africa. I think Kristen would, would like it if she if she's shuttling between Africa and Nigeria. And uh, I just put the link in the uh, chat room. And uh, and now I look for, you know, just a variety of opportunities that uh, that I'm knowledgeable about, such as micropayments and uh, just anything that's going to build up the, uh, the ecosystem in Africa. So. Uh, certainly excited to hear uh, the pitches today. Great, and and you you you're also operational in Kenya, is that right? Yeah, we're operational with Kakuma in Kenya, and so um, so we we were doing that project there, and we we have a little a few guys in Nairobi who are are working on raising funds for that. So great, well, wonderful. Thanks for joining the show, and Vishal, welcome back. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be back. I kind of feel like I have permanent residency in, on the show, for which I'm thankful. Um, uh, I've been a former partner of PwC, uh, G leader. Um, three years ago, I broke away from my 25-year corporate life to set up a investment firm. Um, I have three dozen startups in my portfolio, 12 of which I closed this year. Four or five of them are actually with Jim, and I all 12 are with my buddy Raj, who I see logged in three exits this year, which I'm pretty proud of. Um, and, and some other investments in hospitality and real estate. And always like and, to, to hear pictures of the day. And, and your best investments will be the ones you've done with me, right? I hope. All the time, Jim, all the time. Good, good. We'll, we'll, we'll see if that's the case. And uh, you're also an author. Um, tell us more about your book. Um, the book is called Give to Get, which kind of defines the philosophy of, of how I like doing business, uh, let alone sort of investing in, in, in firms. And the book was really a how-to for, for leaders to navigate their corporate life. It was a transition from my corporate life to, to my, my entrepreneurial life uh, post 25 years of corporate life. And, and that was kind of my give back to, to the corporate world. It's called Give Together. It's on Kindle and Amazon, made number one uh, around the world when it came out three years ago. Great, congratulations. Um, well, great. Well, thank you all three of you for joining us. And without further ado, we're gonna head over to the entrepreneurs uh, Radhika and Mutembe, thank you for joining us today. I think we're going to start with Radhika, but before we get started, just a few quick rules of the game. So you will have five minutes to present, and only five minutes. We will cut you off for five minutes, but you will then have um, 15 to 20 minutes of, of time for Q&A and discussion with the angels, and hopefully coming to uh, a deal. So uh, please uh, keep your presentation concise so we have lots of time to discuss with the angels and with the rest of the audience after your presentation. So with that, uh, over to you, Radhika, are you ready with your presentation? I am, I'll just share my screen now. It says I can't share the screen. Okay, so I think, there we go. You should be able to share your screen now. Perfect, thank you. 
Hi, I'm Indervu, uh, the CEO of, um, uh, I'm Radhika, the CEO of Indervu, the Betterment for Africa. Coming from a financial background, I want, when I moved back to Kenya, I was really curious to understand how people invested their savings. And I was surprised to find that there's currently $85 billion sitting in cash accounts across Africa. This is equivalent to the GDP of Kenya. And this is a problem because African countries have high rates of inflation, which means Africans are losing purchasing power over time. So we ran a survey to understand why and learned three key things. People don't know where to start, lack education and advice. The process is overly complicated with tedious paperwork and they lack access because of high minimums and the limited options available in the market. Endovu is a micro-investment platform that provides easy access to financial markets. So how does it work? You come onto our platform, we ask you a series of questions to understand your ability to take risk. Our algorithms take that information and then assign a unique investment strategy. They then invest and start earning a return. Along the journey, we also provide educational content to improve our users' customer uh, financial literacy. Our serviceable market across Sub-Saharan Africa is 8.5 billion, of which we will acquire 1 billion in five years through expansion, and we've set up in Kenya. Our team consists of Gianpaolo. Uh, he's our CTO with 19 years of experience. He's a serial entrepreneur who has built and scaled products. He also exited a company that he grew from three to 150 employees, which is now global. Ro is our chief commercial officer. He has 16 years of experience in the local financial markets. He launched the first mobile-based government bond called Emakiba whilst working at the Nairobi Stock Exchange, which was oversubscribed. I worked at BlackRock and Deloitte advising clients on how to invest, and I managed a book of $3 billion, which included wealth tech platforms. Together, we have, a we have strong experience in building and scaling tech, as well as financial products, which will lead to best execution. So how do we make money? Uh, we have two revenue streams. Fund managers who are suppliers get access to our customers because we bring down their customer acquisition cost. We're, so they pay us 1.5% commission for every dollar that gets invested. Our customers who come onto Endovu to use our service pay us $25 as an annual account fee. To validate our business, we ran an early access campaign asking our potential customers how they would invest once we launched. In four days, we had 97 signups with $110,000 committed. Since then, our customer base has grown to 200. We've launched our MVP and now generating revenue. So who are our target customers? So there are millennials who are tech savvy in touch with global trends. There are 12 million in Kenya and 450 million in Africa. Through our research, 85% of them told us they're looking for better ways to invest. In terms of our go-to-market strategy, we, have, uh, we will be uh, using distribution partners to uh, distribute our product. Today, uh, with all the partnerships we've signed, we have, over, we have access to over 550,000 potential customers, and we're talking to many more. In terms of supply side, we are, we've already signed one fund manager. As you're probably aware, a B2B relationship can take over, on average, 18 months to sign, but we signed one fund manager in three months, which really shows the strength of our network. We're also speaking to other fund managers in the ecosystem. We see our competition as all institutions that hold our savings and we're differentiated because our solution focuses on providing advice leading to responsible investing. We also have strong networks and relationships demonstrated by us being able to sign a fund manager so quickly, but we also have the experience that is required for building and scaling tech products, as well as a deep under understanding of financial model uh, markets, which would lead to best execution. So our unit economics are as so, uh, our customer lifetime value is $151. Our customer acquisition cost is $20, and this gives us a overall positive contribution margin of 76%. So our ask today, we are looking to raise $300,000 by March, 2021. We've already raised $50,000. These funds will allow us to fully develop an automated product, acquire 13,000 customers, and also add additional product offerings. Yeah, so thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Great presentation, Radhika, and uh, thanks for being right on time. In fact, a little bit early. So uh, over to the angels. Love to hear your thoughts on Radhika's presentation in Dovo. Raj, would you like to start? For, I'm sorry, Michelle, would you like to start first? 
Okay. May I just request? Michelle, you, you can be right. <laughs> Uh, the revenue page. Yeah, please. Yeah, sure thing. Oops, sorry, gone too far. There we go. No, the, the, what you've earned, not the model. There was a page oh, okay. that had Here we numbers. Go. Oh, there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing a boat spiral that you're asking me. That wasn't me laughing, by the way. That was me. <laughs> uh, forgive me, can we go back to the last page again while we ask you questions? This one or the, the, the ask? The ask, yeah. Okay. So you were just too quick for my blood at this time? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> So, so what, oh, go ahead. Go ahead uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Kurt. Yes, yeah, sir. I really, I really love what you're doing. I think, I think, um, you know, helping people save and, and then invest the right way easily is, is obviously a powerful business model we've seen in the U S um, recently with some of these robo advisors. Uh, and, and that's kind of similar, right? Like it's a little similar to what you're doing. Correct. Very exactly similar. similar to what I'm doing. So we're a robo yeah. advisor. Yeah, and so I think it's just it's just really awesome to get more people into that to that network. And I, and I guess the, the you know the big question is, and I guess that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to get into corporations who then offer it to their their cust their their employees, correct? That's correct. That's the yes. primary way, rather than go after a consumer uh, consumer market. Now, where, is there an automatic debit that goes into the account then that they can just say I put in you know? so forth and so on. Exactly, so. so they can pick and choose how they would like to set it up, but essentially you can have an automated debit so they don't need to go into their account and debit it, or if they want, they can top up as in how they wish. And is that because there's no like, is there no 401k systems or is there no like mutual, is there no system set up already like we take for granted in the US that we have that? Kurt, great observation. So in Kenya, the pension scheme landscape is very, very different to the states. So actually not a lot of companies will have a 401k system whereby you can simply uh, deduct it before you even pay your tax, for example. And that's what normally happens in the West. So uh, the corporations that we've been speaking to have been very positive about our solution because it allows them to sort of tackle this pension problem they have. Uh, but this I'm talking about the smaller, small to medium sized businesses. I mean, larger corporations Corporations such as Coca-Cola will already have a pension plan in place. Uh, right. Um, have you seen the piggy bank in Nigeria? You mean piggy vest? Yes. Piggy vest is that maybe they changed it. Um, okay. Um, they seem they seem to have done pretty decent. They did a deal with a bank, I think, and it, they did something where automatic savings kind of go into there. I think that bank route was really successful and to gaining customers. Um, so I guess, I guess the two questions I have is what are your biggest challenges, you know, in 2021, like what's your main KPI? Is it getting corporate signed up? And like, how many customers do you think logically you can get to um, in right, terms of right. people? So we look at our KPIs in twofold. So it's the number of customers we acquire and also our, the number of assets under management. Um, so on the on the customers acquiring, we're looking to acquire in the first year uh, 2,000 customers. Um, and the, what I'm showing on the screen is actually a three-year plan. Um, and so we're doing that through, as you mentioned, corporations. And so far, the conversion rate for our corporation has been 96% uh, from everybody we've spoken to. So we, that's a really high rate. And it's clear there's clearly a need for this type of product in the market. Uh, in terms of assets under management, that is something that we know will increase over time because of the feedback that we've received from customers is that the more familiar they get with investing and because we're investing in a responsible way, the return experience tends to be very positive, which means people, once they get comfortable, they see the, their assets going up, we will see a lot higher um, increase in the amount of money people put in our portfolios. Okay. Um, hi, Radhika. How's it going? Good, thanks. You? 
Okay, it's a pleasure to meet you and um, great pitch. So I think there are two things I'm quite curious about, and I think they're along the lines of some of Kurt's questions, right? So uh, I want to understand how you might be different from a shaka or bamboo. Um, and I also want to also understand, so this with this B2B to C model, right? You're, I guess, making it easier for them to do the withdrawal right up front, right? So that they don't have to have it in their personal accounts first and then have to make that decision about whether or not they want to invest. Um, I'm curious about how much control they are experiencing and then also how much transparency. So is this sort of like thing where the company has visibility on how their employees are managing um, their stocks? I just want to understand also that like privacy um, aspect of it. So I think those are two key questions for me. How are you differentiated from some of the players on, on, on our side in West Africa? And then also how much privacy and transparency um, exists and control as well for, for your end user? Yeah, no, sure. So uh, the first question about how we're differentiated from the likes of Bamboo and Chaka. Now, it's like comparing Betterment to Robinhood. The value proposition is very different. In a Robinhood scenario, you as the user is, is uh, responsible for making your trades and making your investment decisions. Whereas as a robo-advisor, you're getting expert advice that allows you to invest in instruments that give you steady returns over time. So, you, so the value proposition for both will attract different type of customers, and that's why we're different. Also, when you look at the business model, it is also different because Bamboo makes money on trading commissions, we make money on assets under management. So it's a very different model. Um, in terms of your second question, I hope that answered your first one. <laughs> if you have any uh, follow on? Yeah, good. Uh, in terms of the second- Follow up, but yeah, keep going. So in terms of the second piece, um, so, the feedback we're getting from corporations is two things. They don't want to have the liability associated with us. So they want to do their checks saying, you know, you're a good provider, you've got the right processes in place, but we don't want to make sure that if anything goes wrong, we don't want to be liable for our, customer, for our end users money. Um, so what they're encouraging is that they are willing to have us incorporated in their financial plans, provided the end user is able to recognize that the, the, their decision of investing is on them. And what that in turn does is allows the end user to have privacy. So the only information that a, um, a uh, employer would have is how many, what percentage of their employees is actually using our investment platform. And that is it. And that's where it ends. And I think that's a really good way to sort of keep it because I do agree if I was with an employer, I wouldn't want them to know how much money I have in my portfolio. <laughs> In a nice gotcha. So, so it's just what percentage of our employees are using this service, but not what volume or what percentage of their income is going into the service. Exactly. Um, and then with, yeah, and then if they integrate it as a 401k, like Kurt mentioned, then they do would have a bit of visibility of how much they're investing on behalf of their employees, but they still don't have access to what, how much the employee itself is topping up. Gotcha. And with that sort of integration, is that an important part of your business model or is that something that you're still not very interested in pushing? So no. So the, the short answer is not, not interested in pushing at this stage, but eventually we do see value for it. The only reason is that we want to get and acquire early customers. And the best way to do that is keep the operational piece low and very easy. Okay, so talk to me a bit about technology and just, you know, the user experience, the back end, you know, how compatible are you with low internet bandwidth, tricky speeds, um, what's how, how, what sort of languages are you operating in, are you just working in English or are you working in some of the primary languages um, that people are often conversing and using. Um, I, I can see that in, when you were talking about your market size and you were looking, you know, at the entire continent. So I imagine that you have plans for expansion. Um, so I guess two questions here. The very first question is around, you know, just the technology, the UX, UI um, pieces as well. And then the second question is around just your approach to expansion and how are you thinking about the idiosyncrasies and opportunities in the different markets? 
Yeah, no, sure thing. So for the first question, uh, in terms of the technology, so uh, Gian Paolo has 19 years of experience and he's worked, that's our CTO. He has worked on building and scaling actually crypto type of platforms before. So he comes in with strong expertise. We will be building our in-house technology uh, platform in order to be able to manage the trades and link it with other fund managers. Um, and we're using uh, general ledgers type sure that our platform is not only secure, but things are recorded and reconciled properly. Uh, in terms of the UX UI, our, sorry, it says my internet is unstable, but let me know if you can't hear me. Um, in terms of our UI UX, for us, it's keeping the user journey very simple. So for us, that is one key thing that we want to keep um, because we don't want to lose people. And along the UX UI, we also provide educational content to help improve our underlying, our users' understanding of what financials is. Um, and then moving on to your next question, absolutely right. We are looking to expand into Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we are um, targeting those customers who want to make steady incremental growth in the investment return versus those customers who are looking to, you know, buy a Apple stock and, you know, make those regular trades on that basis. Um, and so in terms, so we do have looked at the African continent in the first area of expansion would be East Africa. Can you, um, sorry. Uh, uh, Michelle, I know you had some questions earlier on. You want to jump in? Congratulations, Halika. I really enjoyed that, and, and congratulations for um, building what you have already. Um, I'm sort of preoccupied when I think about this space around the regulatory climate, right? So I want to really understand that view because, particularly in Kenya, the asset management side, the custodian side, and the investment side is all split up, as you know, mm -hmm. and the margins are really thin and it's a highly regulated space. So first, I want to kind of understand what have you actually already achieved and what have you thought about from a regulatory standpoint and a licensing standpoint and just bring us up to speed on that. And then two, to the expansion dialogue that we just had, how are you structured from a holding standpoint to do Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda, whatever? Are you going to expand out of Kenya or have you set up a holding structure elsewhere? So those two questions. No, great. So for, to answer your first question about regulation, um, completely recognize that actually, even though Africa is seen by the West as in a continent, actually, we have different types of behaviors and regulations in different areas of Africa. So we are, we're quite cognizant of that. And we have decided to apply for the CMA Sandbox license. Because for us, that gives us, uh, so if for those who don't know, the sandbox really is a regulatory uh, box that you can go into and the regulatory helps you build and shape your fintech product uh, with the guidance. So it really lets you grow, but in, in the realms of like under good rec regulatory governance. So we've entered into that. Um, and so we, we, will be receiving uh, an update soon, which is great. But we also have the option of, if we don't get in through the regulatory sandbox, which I don't think is gonna be a thing because we have very good networks and connections to our advisors and, and, and also on the team. Um, and we really understand the regulatory requirements. Um, we also can just simply be a digital agent um, as this model. So we still have, uh, we still have a, a, an alternative solution if we don't get the regulatory guidance approval. Uh, but that is our plan A and our plan B would be to be a digital agent. Now, in terms of moving into different uh, African continents and the regulation there, we've done a bit of research, but I'll be completely honest with you. We, we know like what we need to do, but we haven't got there because for us, it's really to prove the next one year. Um, and then obviously as we start doing better, we will definitely look at other areas. Now, your second question was around, uh, please remind me. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute, but scaling this from a structure standpoint, right? So we're currently set up in Kenya, uh, but we are uh, setting up our Delaware Corporation in the States, and that will allow us to then move into different areas. 
So will you be taking investment into your Delaware Corporation or into a Kenyan okay, Delaware Corporation? So it just depends on the investor. Um, so far, we've we've got some local investors who wanted to come through the Kenyan and then we're quite flexible at this stage. And the other company um, wants to come through the States. So we've we've just been flexible. Where is the IP being held or what is, which is the parent? Uh, Delaware. Delaware. Okay. I had some quick questions around your customers. So you say 10 customers. I'm assuming those are corporate customers. Um, is that right? No. So there's a, so the way we did it was we had launched a, an early access campaign. And in order to, to ensure that the product that we're building is right, we ran our customers through the journey, but manually. So we have a pipeline of 200 customers and we don't want to convert them now because it takes quite a lot of time. And as you can imagine, when you're starting a startup, you need to manage your resources. So the reason where we're converted some in batches was just really to understand what what really works well, what doesn't work well. But we have a pipeline of 200 customers who will invest more than $110,000 because that was based on the first set of 100 customers. Um, yeah, so sorry, continue with your question. No, 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 just a clarification. So thanks for that clarification. So those customers have been on your platform for how long? For two months. Two months, okay. Thank you for that. Michelle, Kurt, Kristen, any other questions, comments? None, none for me right now. Okay. Well, um, there, there are a couple I have, of questions. I have one, from the, one last question. Please go ahead, Kurt. Um, your technical team, your CTO, can you tell me a little bit more about your technical team and how, where you're going to, you know, is he building all of it or do you have, are you building an engineering team somewhere else? Yeah, we are. So that's a, yeah, I mean, sorry, I didn't make that clear. So um, Gian Paolo has, so he's a strategic um, technical chap. He's the guru. He will, when I come up with a commercial idea, he'll tell me why it doesn't work and why it does work. And, and essentially underneath him, he has a team of six developers that he's working with. Um, and these are people that he um, has got through his network. Um, and that's how we're building the product. Is he a, is he a, employee is he a consultant is he, is no, he full so time? he's full-time he's full-time and he's a he's a co-founder so so there is a question for go ahead no is he based in kenya so not at the moment because of COVID, but he was based in Kenya before COVID happened. Um, right now, I think he's in Amsterdam. I can't keep a track on him. He's always traveling, but he's originally from Italy. So there's, there's a question from Dan Block. Thank you, Dan. Um, you know, I, I think he, he rightly points out that there are quite a few competitors in this field. And I know you had a comp competition slide, um, but you know, uh, his question is about how do you differentiate from some of the other competitors in the field, bamboo, calorie rise, et cetera, almost identical models. Um, but he points out too, that uh, you do have a B to, to B to C model versus just straight B to C model. Is that the primary difference um, in terms of, of, of growing your user base and customer engagement? So I think that's a great question. And when we talk about competition, like I have done a lot of research on all of the models that exist. So I will say that we are uh, fundamentally different. So without taking too much time, Piggyvest just tell you to come onto the platform, give them a bit of your money and they'll give you a return. In, in these times where actually bond deals have come down, they've really struggled to meet their customer returns because they were just buying government paper, but yields have gone up, uh, down, sorry. And that means that actually they're not able to deliver that. So they have to take the money out of their pocket. So that's one business uh, model. Um, with and, and on PiggyVest, they do this type of a, this livestock lending, which is like a micro lending platform on which they make money. So it's a completely different model if you really deep dive. CurryWise, again, they, they do something similar to us, but again, they only have a few mutual funds. So they would probably be the closest person to us, but we have ways of differentiating, but we just, uh, which we have in our longer strategy plan, which could mean um, other types of products. Um, and then in terms of bamboo, we're a completely different business model. Um, you know, bamboo makes money on co like commissions and trades. We make money on the assets that are invested through our platform. Uh, yes, and again, it, bamboo appeals to those who are a bit more confident and would like to trade Apple stock based on news information because 
if you're in the audience and you think you can buy and trade stocks on a daily and think you can time the market, I, I'm coming from financial experience and being in the market for a very long time, think that is the wrong way to think about it. You really need to think about diversifying your portfolio, which means you need to hold funds. So it's a very different... It, so fundamentally, they might look the same on the top because we're offering trading. But if you dig a little deeper, our business model is very different. And also, yes, we acquire customers differently. Um, and also we're trying to build, I know a lot of VCs will say, you know, investing money in education um, is sometimes uh, costly. But I really believe in this particular field and even in the, in the West, and even if you look at companies in India, Indonesia, they've really spent some time on education and that's something that will set us apart. Bamboo doesn't do education. Okay, no, thank you for that. Well, over to the angels, um, your thoughts. Um, I'm happy to go first. Um... Radhika, look, really, really interesting company, but early for my blood, right? I'm, uh, I'm more of a seed investor. I want to see your licenses come through. Um, we have an election the year after this next year. So I want to see the results of that licensing process because this is a highly regulated space. Um, and I want to see a little more traction. But having said that, I've got at least two founders in my portfolio that I want to introduce you to because I think there's some cross-pollination within my portfolio and you. And I'd like to stay in touch because I'd like to buy into your seed round. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Kurtz, Kristen? Uh, great, Cut. do you wanna go ahead or shall I? Please, please, I'm still thinking about it. Okay. Um, okay, Radhika, I, I think you did an excellent job. It was a great pitch. Um, you're definitely early, but you seem to be making some really uh, good strategic decisions. Um, so a bit like I said, I definitely want to be in touch, um, talk to you a bit more outside of this forum and get a sense of where you're thinking long term. Uh, I think this space is, is a tricky space. Like you said, it's very promising, but it's also quite a, a tricky terrain to play in. Um, and you're starting in a market that does have a, quite a bit of regulation. So I am also quite interested in how that license um, process go, goes along. Um, I only have done about two or three investments in East Africa so far, um, only one of them being in Kenya. Um, I am interested in what you're doing, but I, I do want to understand a bit more. Um, but well done, honestly. Uh, great work that you're doing so far. Thank you. Yeah, I think you've made some amazing traction in a half a year. I mean, I mean to, to get the technology up and to get customers going. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal, to be honest with you. Uh, so I, I definitely applaud you there. And, um, um, you know, I don't know enough about the regulation to know what the risks are there, but it, uh, it certainly seems like it would be a, a rather big market, even in just Kenya alone. Um, so uh, I also think it's a really interesting space just with all the robo advisors and financial services. I mean, th these are the companies that are investing in Africa, right? Like, uh, and so sooner or later, you're going to have these companies come out there and make some investments or, or do uh, acquisitions, yeah. you know, do whatever, right. Partnerships. So um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a cool space um, to be in. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I have to, I have to think about it a little bit more, maybe, maybe have another call with you or two to decide what I would do. Um, I think so. that sounds great. And uh, just a quick uh, note from Kian Kasari, uh, the earlier the investment, the greater the return, triple dollar sign. So keep that in mind. Um, and a note from Dan Block, oops, lost, uh, just lost a note there. A note from Dan Block, uh, oh, lost it. Just that, um, you know, taking the B to C, B to B to the C approach uh, versus the B to C, um, you know, might uh, lead to greater market capture. So thanks for that comment. Um, I think I, on, on my side, I'd love to stay in touch. I think um, uh, obviously a robo advisor, or if you will, call it digital securitization. I think that's uh, that's the trend going forward for the next ten years. And I'm really happy to see companies like Howard Wise and your company and others trying to tackle that for the African continent. But I also like the fact that you're really taking a different approach to doing it. 
And I think solving that pain point with uh, corporations who don't have pension schemes to offer their employees is a really interesting tack. So I would love to take uh, a closer look at your technology and understand what you've built so far and what your roadmap looks like. And stay tuned for um, um, you know, for 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 your round, and, and and you know, maybe I'll take uh, Kian's uh, advice and invest early. So let's have that conversation, and uh, we can go from there. Thank you, thank so you much, very Jim. much for the presentation. And thank you all the judges for your comments. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for that, and um, let's just share the results really quickly of the public view. Um, so the public was uh, quite enthusiastic as well. Uh, close to 70% uh, indicated they'd be interested in investing something in, in Dovu. So congratulations on a, a good um, response from the public as well. All right, now over to the next entrepreneur. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Jim. Great. Hi. And um, am I pronounce your name right, um, uh, Mutembe? Mutembe, yes. Mutembe, okay, great. Well, welcome to the nest and uh, we're ready for your presentation when you're ready. Let me share my screen. Just one second, sorry about that. Perfect. So my name is Omtembe Kariki. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fastaga. We are democratizing artificial intelligence while creating opportunities for the millions of young people on the African continent by introducing them to the data labeling market. So we believe that artificial intelligence is going to transform uh, the world um, in the next uh, 100 plus years. And so we are building technology for the next 100 plus years of, of Africa. So the problem. Looking at this picture, this is in 2020. Um, I think we can all look at one of the images and we can clearly see that's probably uh, President, former President Obama. But the AI could not figure out who it was and ended up having the picture on the, on the right. And this is because AI needs a lot of very contextual data. And in the case of Africa, we don't have enough data that is out there to make sure that the AI can work for Africa. For example, it takes about a million images to make a deep learning AI. That takes about 100,000 man hours. And a lot of companies just don't have the amount of time to develop this for the African continent. So what we are doing is starting with democratizing artificial intelligence by creating these labeled data sets for African challenges. We have a particular focus on areas around health, agriculture, language data sets that can be used for farm education and infrastructure. One of the challenges that uh, we en encountered with our, our client is that uh, they are at the University of Bern and they were trying to develop a model to detect skin cancer, but they could not find enough labeled data sets of African skin. So that means they could not develop AI that can actually be able to detect uh, skin cancer for Africans. Again, even in the agriculture sector, most of the land that and satellite images that are, are labeled are from Western Europe and North, uh, North America and parts of Asia, but very few are from Africa. That means we cannot build the AI that can help Africa combat climate change in the future. Now, this is creating a situation where in 2018, $2 trillion was created in additional GDP by AI. This is expected to grow by 8X to $15.7 trillion by 2030. So Africa risks on lo losing out on this increase in GDP if we don't use AI to solve the challenges that are on the continent. So our customer is an AI project manager or researcher in an organization trying to implement AI for the African continent. But what the challenge is, is that they cannot find the training data and they cannot have enough opportunity to label the data sets. So where we come in is by offering an end-to-end -end AI service. That's data management, annotation, building models, and then offering the models via API to companies. What we have built is a platform which, which can have on-demand on labeling of data. We've started with satellite imagery. It takes about 
10 hours for one person to label one satellite image because it has to be broken into 10 tasks, depending in this particular case on building detection. And one particular challenge we found here is with one of the clients is that they wanted to have a rooftop detection model for solar power in Somalia, but the current models could not function well because they are based on labeling from other continents. This is one of the models that we're building, which is tapping into a two point. $223 billion market by 2026 in terms of solar power on the continent. And that's one of the areas we're targeting with an API that can be given to different organizations working in the solar sector. So one of our key focus areas is using this AI uh, models that we are creating for the crop yield estimation on the continent. This is a big challenge for a lot of uh, farmers uh, across the continent. And one of the biggest applications of AI is in agriculture. But again, we cannot be able to do this. We were engaging with different startups that were not able to get the right training data, the right quality. One of the opportunities we see of creating job opportunities is in the labeling of this, we need hundreds of thousands of young people who are able to label this and we train them to do it. So far we have a, about 100 young people who are earning up to $250 in a month to do this. So this is an education opportunity for African youth. The market alone for data labeling, we are also offering this managed teams to global markets, was 2000, in 2018, 150 million, and it's projected to grow up to 4 billion in 2023. This is an increase of 26.7%. Of and as we can see, there is also a, a continuous increase in jobs in the gig economy. So our current model is we offer annotation services to different companies. And then we have a freemium model that we will create for the access to the labeled data sets. We have a free pro and premium. For the pro and premium, it's about $90, $99 a month. And for the premium, it's $499. So far, we've generated about 8,900 USD from the labeling um, of, 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 of satellite imagery and other imagery from, from companies outside of Africa. We've worked with about 100 youth and they've already been able to do about 380,000 annotations and we have future projects on the pipeline. And the model that we have been creating um, for API use is a solar algorithm. We have a strong team. Um, my co-founder, my COO, she's uh, very analytical. She has an actuarial background, worked in, uh, in consulting in Africa and India, and then they got her master's in big data and analytics from Spain. Our CTO has worked at MIT and is currently finishing his PhD at Georgia Tech, worked at Harvard in the geography department. That's why we have a particular focus on GIS. And I have worked um, across the, the globe in, on five continents on different projects um, on working with the German Development Corporation. Finally, uh, our different advisors, we have Todd Simmons, who is a geospatial uh, expert in, in San Francisco, Josh Sigel, who works at, the, at Michigan State University and is an expert on gen, uh, generational uh, gen, adversarial networks. And then we have Kari Katabaki, who works in digital technology. We have partnerships so far signed with Ajira platform for young people. So um, on Tende, you're, you're coming close on time. So if you can wrap it up soon, that'd be great. Yeah. And so we have partnership with Liquid Telecom and Airbus. Our projected revenues are 4.5 million by year five, and we expect to get to a uh, million youth by year five as well. We're asking for 2.7 million for two years to build out the uh, algorithms as well as label the data. We see ourselves, our main competition is Scale AI in the US. And in terms of our ask from the NASDAQ- Can you go back to that, please? Oh, you're sorry, you're sorry, go ahead. You want to go fast. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah, and finally, uh, business metrics. Uh, so far, we had two customers this year um, that got us to raise the $8,900. We have about uh, a margin of 54% uh, from that. Annual monthly revenue is about $1,500 uh, currently. So far, invested in the company, we have uh, $32,000. We also have uh, a commitment of about uh, 20,000 euros. Um, this is from the GIZ, if we can get matching funds. Uh, we have currently runway for the next six months. We plan on um, breaking even in 2023 at a revenue, uh, by, by, with a revenue of 4.9 million. 
Um, current round valuation, uh, so the discount that we're giving is 10%. Our holding is incorporated in Del Delaware. And yeah, so we're using the funds mostly for hiring talent, acquiring acquisition of the satellite and Earth observation imagery. We want to focus um, on getting good uh, ground truthing data using drones and balloons. So yeah, because this is a big challenge of getting high resolution imagery uh, for this particular sector. And then also working cap capital for our labeling projects. Thank, Thank you very much, Matembe. Um, over to the angels. We have a little bit less time for discussion this time around. So um, we have about 10 minutes. Go ahead, who would like to start first? My biggest question is, um, you're really ahead of the curve, it seems to me. I mean, I don't know how much, how many customers in Africa need this service, right? Like I could see like when you did the pictures, like, yeah, maybe Google would hire you to work on African-American faces. Cause I know they did that in Japan, by the way, to help for their AI. Um, uh, they had some locals that helped them to process the data. Um, I'm trying to wonder, like, you know, you say it's a big market, but like, who, who are your targets? Who are your first 10 comp corporate clients? Like, who are they? Are they in your pipeline? Are you talking to them? Like, Okay, yeah. so already for the, the managed teams that we offer, um, those are already, we have uh, platforms. So particularly we've been working with some platforms in South Korea and Silicon Valley. Um, so those are continuously lined up. Um, on the other side, yes, as I mentioned, we are planning for the next 100 years. So a lot of these problems, uh, the solutions will be coming um, as time goes. And just recently, you just mentioned Google. So Google.org, um, Rockefeller, uh, as well as uh, the GIZ just recently set up a, a fund called Lacuna Fund to fill in these labeled um, data sets, uh, gaps on the African continent, and it's still not enough. So we can already see that this is an indicator that a lot of people are saying that this is going to be a challenge on the continent, that AI won't be able to function on the continent and they need to be solutions created for this. And so we intend to be, and actually it's actually good that we are ahead of the curve because that means in another 10, 15, 20, um, 50 years, uh, we'll be the only company with the, with the best models and the best training data to, to, to offer to, to different companies. So, Already you have um, organizations who are in the agriculture space we have been having um, uh, conversations with. So one of the big challenges in the agriculture space is that um, the land um, uh, structuring on, on the African continent is very different from, from the West because we have a lot of small holders. So trying to um, have a good understanding of the size of the land and the type of crops they've, they've, they've grown, um, a lot of that can actually, that problem can be solved by earth observation data, either from drones or balloons or from satellite data. And then you can be able to know which crops, when they are planning to, to harvest those crops. Because if you have earth observation data over a period of time, six months, you can know when they're going to harvest and you can be able to give them the right implements and to give them the right advice and insurance. So we are already having conversations with some of these companies. Um, with, with KEPSA, we've also been having this conversation of engaging with uh, more organizations in the agricultural sector. Um, there is also the World Bank with their uh, project around uh, 1 million farmers. So there are a lot of organizations which once they get access to, to this training data and the models, will be very happy to use them. Thank you for that. Other, other questions from uh, the angels? Vishal, Kristen. Another question. Okay, I I have some. Can you hear me? I picked up. Yes, a bit we can hear you well. Good to see okay, you again. Excellent. Um, okay, awesome. All right, so um, can we go back to a slide where you had something about youth? And there was a couple of slides back. This one. Okay, so the idea, yeah, yeah, so no, no, no. So it, it was an impact slide. So you said a thousand, yes. So yeah. you're trying to leverage them, gotcha. Um, right, so a million, okay, so not a thousand youth, a million youth with digital skills training over the next five years. Um, there's actually a company operating out of Kenya. So um, 
I think the, the let me just say, I think the business model pieces, um, you're very, very early. There's some strategic things that um, you know, we should definitely have a detailed conversation about at a different point. Um, but I'm very, very interested in this sort of like impact gig economy, youth employment question as your vehicle. Um, I can't seem to remember the name right now. There's actually a company um, operating out of Kenya that's doing the same thing, um, much, much bigger than yours, um, foreign owned. Um, I think it's coming out of California. And I do know that one of the big things, right, because they have that same sort of like social enterprise model, but there was a heavy amount of critique about just how much exploitation of these workers. Summer source, thank you so much, Patrick. Exactly, it's called summer source. Um, so lots of critiques of summer source in terms of how um, these young people who are working in Kenya are actually experiencing um, this process, even though the branding in Silicon Valley is completely different. I mean, I was shocked because I heard of it in Silicon Valley, great representation. And then I went to Kenya and completely different experience um, on the ground. So I'm, I'm very, very curious. When, whenever I hear these kinds of AI gig conversations, this model seems to be quite popular of empowering young people and giving them jobs. But what I'm seeing in terms of somebody that's done well with this, has been able to achieve scale and is growing, is that it, it, it looks quite, it's, you know, all that glitters is not gold. So I'm just really interested if you could speak to this impact piece. How do you make this? sustainable um, from an economic perspective, but also if you've taken a triple bottom line approach, right? So people profit planet, right? So you're not just getting the profit piece, right? But also getting the people experience piece, right? I'd love for you to hear more about that. Yeah, thanks so much for that question, Kristen. And it's, it's, it's one that was really big on our mind while looking at, at the landscape. So that's why, for example, we are not just a labeling company. So a lot of these other companies are purely labeling companies because we more or less like if we were to position ourselves, we'd probably um, look at scale AI, right? They, they recently raised their Series D of about 120 million. And so we, we see ourselves more as a proper AI company so that when we're working with these young people, we've already gotten a partnership with the Liquid Telecom. So they have a platform called 21st Century Skills. So all our labelers have access to this platform. And because of COVID, of course, all our workers were remote um, in this case. So they all have a curriculum on learning the basics of AI. And what we've been also working with um, the Ajira platform as part of the government is like a lot of these young people have also gone through trainings with companies such as IBM. And our, our actual goal is actually to have these young people over the period of time they continue working with us besides just the labeling skills, because this is the entry point for them to, to engage with us. Besides getting those skills, what we'll continue doing is upskilling them so that as they come in, as we're supporting more and more companies with the APIs, with the use cases that they're having with AI, these young people can be upskills over the next you know, um, year, two years, three years, four years, five years that they're working with us, because that's actually how we've seen. We've looked at organizations like Summer Source. You have young people who work there for four years, but as you mentioned, you know, they, their skill level has just remained on the labeling. And now some of them have come up onto our, our platform and they're working with us and we're engaging them with the content from the 21st century skills. And the idea is that they should be the people who become cloud engineers. They should be the people who become software developers who can actually work now in our implementation courses of AI in this different organizations and companies and supporting them. So our, we actually really um, thought around that because I mean, as people on the content and young people ourselves on the continent, we actually do not want another situation of just become the new digital sweatshops yeah, on the continent. We, we see an opportunity to not fall behind because of the automation happening around the world because industrialization won't come to the continent because automation will leave manufacturing and data in the, in, in, uh, outside the continent. And that's why we're focusing on building AI on the continent with young people on the continent. They will get the skills to implement that AI on the continent. I hope that has given a bit of an idea of how I think. Yeah, that's certainly helpful. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I want to make sure do, do other people have questions before. You can have my time. Okay, okay. Um, so and so let's let's talk a bit about. So I think somebody had mentioned that you might seem to be a bit early, just in terms of um, the market opportunity. 
And I know that you um, had started to talk around that. Um, I'd love if you could just like revisit that. Um, I ask this because if you look at the traction so far, right, it's about $8,921, right? Um, but there's a pretty massive market opportunity. Um, and so I want to know how you're thinking um, in maybe a bit more detail than you provided during the pitch, because I do know that you had to rush along, how you're thinking about actually achieving um, a, a much, much, much deeper traction and building these sorts of institutional relationships that are going to let you um, succeed. I know those are difficult to do, but it would be good to understand how you're thinking about this. Um, and also what the approach is, is this you know, just a, a better mousetrap? Um, are you faster? Is it, is it the sort of like the cultural um, social edge because you're on the continent, you're dealing with data about, you know, people on the continent or, you know, African-Americans. I, I want to understand um, sort of like the differentiating factor um, and, and what means that you'll survive this stage, right? Because for you in particular in this kind of industry, um, this is a precarious stage. Um, so I'd love to know how you are thinking about things. Yeah, yeah, th thanks for that question. So um, as, as was previously mentioned, and, and particularly because actually I spent about two years in Japan and, and that's actually where a lot of this thought around data um, was coming. You know, what, what builds our moat over the next, um, you know, so, so many years will be the models that we're able to develop from this proprietary data, right? You know, the difference between, um, you know, the software company before and today is that with AI, it's as if you know you 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 have um, you, you get a, a child born today, and then you get a child born in seven years. There's no way that child who's born in seven years will ever catch up with the one who's born to today in terms of like the cognition and, and things like that. All all other things satanic paribas, right? And this is the situation with AI. Like you, you build very powerful modes based on like how you've trained your, your AI, the data you've collected with your AI. And that's why in this particular case, just like the Japanese, we're planning for a hundred plus years, right? Um, these are problems on the continent which will be solved using um, this, this algorithm. They'll be training and getting better and better as time goes. Um, you know, you have data drift and so as, as as more and more data is accumulated into these um, models, as we label more data and more appropriate data, because for example, if it's satellite imagery, there's always these changes that are happening in the environment. So that's one of the ways that we are looking at it in terms of like creating a mode and how we'll be different. Because right now, if you look at global companies, let's just focus on the geospatial side of it, right? Um, you have a couple of companies which can get access to the free satellite imagery from like Sentinel, from the open program of the European Space Agency. So, but these are not high resolution. And also there are not enough satellites over Africa, right? And they're not going over different areas as often as possible. Africa is expected to be the continent with the most urban um, centers above 1 million plus people um, over the next century. These are, these are a lot of changes happening. And so collecting this earth observation data using balloons and drones and using that to train our different models um, that will put us way ahead of anybody else who's doing this. So in this particular case, we are not that business that is like just going to start making money immediately. This is a long game in terms of, you know, being the one who has the proprietary algorithms and the data that will be needed as solutions are being made um, as, 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 as time um, comes. Because you will end up being the only people who have access to this. So in, in an essence, sometimes we, we like comparing and saying that, okay, we'll be the AWS of AI APIs on the continent and the data as well, and owning that particular data. Because at the end of the day, data is going to be what uh, makes the ultimate difference um, as we go into the future. And that's where we, we, we plan on playing and controlling this space, at least for, for the foreseeable future. And so we're trying to play in a place where we'll be the either the, the only or one of the top two or three companies um, around the world who are doing this. But I hope that has given you a bit of perspective. I'm happy to, to elaborate more um, if I missed something from your question. Well, thank you very much, Matembe, for okay, your presentation. You. Kristen, do you have any more questions? Uh, Vishal, I think yeah, you're passing. Um, it, it does. We can you hear me? Yes, You're a little bit broken. Can you repeat that oh, question okay. again? Oh, now I can't hear you. 
Hello, Kristen. Okay, I think uh, her connection is the greatest. Uh, why don't we move to the uh, public poll? So please, um, if you like, let's uh, love to hear the public's, uh, the audience uh, opinions about uh, Fast Agger. And uh, Kristen, if you're back on, uh, love, uh, feel free to ask your, your final question. Okay, I think we're having uh, some, some problems there with, um, with her connection. Uh, Kurt had to drop off, but I'd uh, love to um, hear from uh, both Michelle and Kristen. And Kristen, if you have to do it via chat, we can, we're happy to do that. Uh, what are your thoughts about um, Fast Agger and potentially working with Fast Agger in the future? I'm happy to go first. Look, I will tell me, I, I, it's super cool, right? I really enjoyed that. I think it's really ahead of the curve. For me, it sits, what your building sits somewhere between sort of vocational training, literacy and awareness and impact. I, I don't quite see a profit making business here and perhaps it's me, not you, but what I would do to, to because I, I do think that, that you're doing some super cool stuff. And what I would love to do is buy you lunch in the new year, offer you a lead or a contact or a piece of advice if I can help you. And, and perhaps, perhaps that's what I could give you. So after, this, after the show, I'll, I'll ping you a note. And if you would like, I'd love to buy you lunch in the new year and chat with you a little. Thank you, thank you. I, I look forward to that lunch. Thank you, Vishal. Appreciate that. Kristen, are you still there? Hey, Jim, can I, can I just make one observation? Yes, please, Raj, jump in. I, I, think, I think for picking up on Vishal's thing, I think it's really cool what, what Mtembi is doing. I, I just couldn't work out from the presentation exactly what the business case was and how you were going to scale and, and make, um, make revenue and make this into viable business. That's the piece that, uh, I, partly maybe because it's just me, that I just don't understand this space. Um, but maybe it's not. Uh, and, and I think the one piece of kind of parting advice I would give is that that's the piece that maybe you need to focus a bit more in terms of giving people what's the, what's the finances, what's the business case for, for this company growing to become the company that he thinks it could be. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that piece of advice. Um, I think we may have lost Kristen, so uh, we may not hear from her, um, but let me just give you my thoughts on this, which uh, again, uh, very interesting what you're doing. And I think your presentation was very detailed in terms of the technical aspects and the traction that you have, which is great. Um, clearly it's, it's way outside of my uh, understanding and uh, my investment scope personally, but um, I would like to continue to stay in touch and, and learn a little, little bit more. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I can't be in Nairobi and buy you lunch, but uh, or join join uh, for lunch with you and Vishal. But uh, if there's anything I can do to connect you with um, folks out here in San Francisco, I, I'm very happy to do so. So I'll put that on the table as an offer for my side. And uh, I wish you the best. OK, thank you. OK, I'm, I'm back. Hopefully you hear me. Back. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. So Wonderful. Since yeah, sincere apologies. So Matembe again, excellent job pitching. Um, wonderful idea. Um, I do a lot of work in technology and I, I get where you're trying to go with this. I think that strategically, um, you are going to have to rethink a number of things if you are intending to become profitable. Um, I understand that this is um, a tricky stage. And obviously, I think whenever I work with um, technology entrepreneurs, it's always that interesting balance of what we're doing is really cool and really important. Um, and so so forgetting to tweak, um, you know, the strategic edge to make sure that you're actually able to build a business out of it that can support you. Um, I'm not oh. sure when next I'll be in uh, 
be, but I'm I'm definitely going to share my information um, so that we can be in touch. Uh, I think you're a bit too early, I, I mean, but this is too, you know, at least have an initial conversation with you and then also make some introductions. I think there are um, some people that will be even more useful than I can be along your journey, um, but well done. Keep at it. I think what you're doing is extremely important. Um, and, you know, people like you will be rewarded for, for starting the journey ahead of the curve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Great. Your... Thank you very much for that, Kristen. And the public uh, reaction uh, as well. Uh, I think we have a number of folks who expressed interest, um, but I think uh, perhaps also it's uh, difficult to understand for many of the, the folks uh, as well. So uh, close to 70% of the audience um, Express interest in investing, so congratulations for a good result there. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, we will, the, the, the Nest team will certainly connect everybody and make sure that everybody, um, uh, the angels and the entrepreneurs are connected. And with that, I um, would like to thank everybody for being on the show and uh, for your feedback. And um, uh, prior to the holidays, I wish everybody uh, happy holidays, and we look forward to seeing everybody back here, same time, same place, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. GMT, and 5 p.m. Um, uh, Paris time on January 14th. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the holidays. Bye. Have a good break. Have a good break. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.